Hello everyone and welcome. Today we'll be diving into the fascinating and clinically important world of disorders affecting platelets, hemostasis, and coagulation. This presentation is brought to you by Newton TV, so get ready to study smart. Let's start with the basics, hemostasis. Simply put, hemostasis is the process of stopping bleeding. This involves two main processes, primary hemostasis, which is platelet aggregation, and secondary hemostasis, which is fibrin formation. Ultimately, these processes work together to produce a clot or thrombus. But remember, problems can arise in the form of excessive bleeding or excessive clotting. This is an overview of what we'll be discussing. Abnormalities in platelets or clotting factors can lead to hemostatic disorders. Keep in mind the normal platelet range, 150,000 to 400,000 cells per microliter. We'll also touch on thrombocytopenia, low platelets, and thrombocytosis, high platelets, and how medications, illnesses, and genetic disorders can affect hemostatic factors. Here's another overview slide, focusing on the steps involved in hemostasis and thrombosis. There are three major steps to achieve hemostasis, vasoconstriction, platelet plug formation, and blood coagulation. Thrombus formation can occur in response to injury or sluggish blood flow. Thrombosis is the generation of an occlusive clot, and this clot formation is balanced by the process of clot dissolution, or fibrinolysis. Now, let's focus on platelets. Platelets are derived from megakaryocytes, and their formation is stimulated by thrombopoietin from the liver. They have a lifespan of 7-10 days, and many are sequestered in the spleen. Endothelial injury exposes collagen and releases von Willebrand factor, which attracts platelets. Glycoprotein 2B3A receptors bind fibrinogen and enhance platelet aggregation, and some antiplatelet agents work by blocking this receptor. Finally, thromboxane A2, released by platelets, promotes platelet aggregation. Next, we'll discuss coagulation factors. Coagulation is a cascade reaction requiring calcium and vitamin K. There are two pathways, the intrinsic pathway, triggered by damage to the vessel, and the extrinsic pathway, triggered by damage outside the vessel. Both pathways ultimately converge at the same steps. Activation of factor X, conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, and conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. Let's take a closer look at the extrinsic pathway. It begins with the activation of factor 7, which comes into contact with tissue factor to form a complex. This eventually leads to the activation of factor X. The clotting time of the extrinsic pathway is measured using the prothrombin time, PT, and the international normalized ratio, INR. Now, let's examine the intrinsic pathway. This pathway is initiated by injury to the vessel or activation by stasis of blood, leading to the activation of factor D steen. This eventually leads to the activation of factor X. The clotting time of the intrinsic pathway is measured by the activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT. This slide explains clot dissolution, also known as fibrinolysis. Tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, converts plasminogen to plasmin, which then breaks down clots. Recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, RTPA, also known as altiplase, can be used therapeutically to break down clots. Now we'll move on to clotting disorders. These disorders can arise from increased platelet number and activity, or from increased coagulation activity. Let's discuss increased platelet number and activity. Some causes of increased platelet number include splenectomy and myeloproliferative disorders. Paradoxical bleeding may occur if platelets are dysfunctional. Increased platelet activity can result from endothelial injury and sluggish blood flow, and risk is increased by smoking, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. There are two types of thrombocytosis primary and secondary. Primary thrombocytosis is essential and related to a bone marrow issue. 
secondary thrombocytosis is reactive and related to cancer, inflammation, or infection. This slide covers increased coagulation activity, stasis of blood flow, such as with immobility, sedentary behavior, atrial fibrillation, and deep vein thrombosis, DVT, can lead to pulmonary embolism. Increased coagulation factors can be seen with estrogen use in women over 35, and some cancer tumor cells secrete prothrombotic factors. Decreased antithrombotic factors can also be seen with estrogen and some cancer tumor cells. This image illustrates venous clots, specifically focusing on deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and its potential to lead to pulmonary embolism. This diagram illustrates the effects of atrial fibrillation, AFib. A thrombus in the left atrium of the heart can lead to an embolus that travels through the bloodstream, potentially blocking blood flow to the brain, causing a stroke. Now, let's shift our focus to bleeding disorders. These can be caused by decreased platelet number and activity, impaired platelet activity, or defective coagulation. Platelets must be severely depleted less than 20,000 per UL, before spontaneous bleeding arises. Defective coagulation can result from impaired synthesis of coagulation factors. Decreased platelet number and activity can be caused by decreased platelet production, excessive pooling of platelets in the spleen, or decreased platelet survival. Decreased platelet production can be caused by suppression of bone marrow, aplastic anemia, leukemia, and radiation exposure. Decreased platelet survival can be caused by antiplatelet antibodies and mechanical injury. Impaired platelet activity can be caused by antiplatelet therapy agents, side effects of some drugs like aspirin and other NSAIDs, renal failure and inherited disorders. Aspirin causes irreversible acetylation of platelet cyclooxygenase, decreasing platelet adherence, and its effect lasts for the platelet lifespan. Other NSAIDs have a reversible effect. Defective coagulation and impaired synthesis can be due to deficiencies in clotting factors, such as in hemophilia and von Willebrand disease, VWD, or impaired synthesis, such as in liver disease and vitamin K deficiency. Assessment of bleeding and clotting disorders involves considering several factors. We need to assess for bleeding, such as nosebleeds and bruising, and clotting, such as DVT and pulmonary embolism. We also need to review medications for possible effects and consider factors that increase or decrease clotting, as well as lifestyle choices like smoking and alcohol abuse. For diagnosing hemostasis disorders, we use tests like CBC, peripheral blood smear, PT, INR, and APTT. Anticoagulants prolong clotting time, leading to higher PT, INR, and APTT values than normal. A normal INR is 1, and anticoagulant usage should result in an INR greater than 1, typically between 2 and 3. Treatment with antiplatelet drugs is crucial for preventing arterial clots, while anticoagulants are used for venous clots. Aspirin is the most common antiplatelet drug and hydroxyurea suppresses platelet production in bone marrow. Platelet pheresis is used for life-threatening elevation in platelets, removing platelets from the blood. Heparin activates antithrombin, limiting clot extension, but requires careful monitoring with APTT, and protamine sulfate is used to neutralize it if bleeding occurs. This slide compares different anticoagulants, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, LMWH, and fondaparinox. It highlights key characteristics such as administration methods, monitoring requirements, half-life, side effects, and predictability. Vitamin K antagonists like warfarin interfere with vitamin K-dependent clotting factors. Warfarin levels peak around 90 minutes after administration, requiring frequent PT and INR monitoring due to variable responses. Its effects can be counteracted by giving vitamin K. Thrombolytic agents, also known as clot busters, dissolve thrombi. 
They can be delivered systemically or by catheter and are tissue plasminogen activators, TPA. They are used for ischemic stroke and MI and timing of use is critical. Drug-induced thrombocytopenia can be caused by over 1,500 medications, herbal and over-the-counter medications. It may be misdiagnosed as autoimmune destruction of platelets. Symptoms include lightheadedness, chills, fever, and bleeding, and usually appear after a week or longer on the drug. Treatment involves stopping the medication, which should resolve symptoms in several days. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, high T, is not associated with bleeding, but rather clot formation. It involves an antibody to heparin, and some individuals develop thrombocytopenia. It can occur with standard heparin or LMWH. Immune thrombocytopenic purpura, ITP, is a common autoimmune disorder involving autoantibodies to the GPIIB3A complex. In children, it often follows viral infection and presents with petechiae and purpura, and is normally self-limiting. Adults tend to have a chronic form. Diagnosis is by exclusion, and treatment includes IV immunoglobulin, platelet transfusion, and immunosuppressants. Thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, TTP, presents with thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, vascular occlusions, fever, neurological abnormalities, and renal disease. It is caused by a deficiency in ADAMTS-13 that works on VWF, leading to unmodified VWF, causing platelet aggregation and widespread clot formation. The onset is abrupt and may be fatal. Treatment is plasmapheresis, which has an 80%-90% recovery rate. Hemophilia has two major forms, both X-linked recessive, hemophilia A, factor UF deficiency, and hemophilia B, factor NIME deficiency. It may also occur by spontaneous mutation. There are different levels of severity, and factor 8 and factor 9 replacement therapies are available. Von Willebrand disease, VWD, is a genetic disease with a defect in VWF. Symptoms include easy bruising, excessive menstrual blood loss, and nosebleeds. Diagnosis involves assessing VWF factor, PT and APTT. Most cases are mild and do not need treatment, but VWF products or stimulants to increase VWF levels can be used. Patients should avoid aspirin. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, involves progressive renal failure, hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. It presents with bloody diarrhea, lysis of RBCs and WBCs, and renal damage. There are two forms, STEX HUS, Shiga toxin producing HUS, often from E. coli O157H7 infections, and non-STX HUS. Diagnosis is by stool culture. Treatment is supportive therapy, antibiotics, hemodialysis, and renal transplantation. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, is a disorder of clot formation and bleeding episodes. Clot formation leads to depletion of coagulation factors, and elevated fibrinolysis leads to bleeding. It develops secondary to other significant disorders, such as septic shock, massive trauma, burns, and transfusion. Diagnosis involves elevated D-dimer, clotting times, and RBC hemolysis. Treatment focuses on controlling the primary disease and preventing further clotting. This table summarizes key lab tests used in the diagnosis of bleeding and clotting disorders, including platelet count, reticulocyte count, D-dimer, APTT, and PT, along with their descriptions and associated abnormalities. Thank you for your time and attention. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video to support New Teen TV and help us continue to provide you with valuable medical education. Study smart.